Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to our webinar, Technology Investments and ROI. We're happy that you could join us. My name is Rich Verva. I'm uh, the host for today's webinar. Um, I'm the publisher and editor of Industrial Supply Magazine. I'd like to thank our host, Epicor, for their support. Epicor provides industry-specific business software designed around the precise needs of distributors. The company has more than 40 years of experience with distributors' unique business processes and operational requirements. I invite you to visit Epicor's website at uh, epicor.com to learn more. We'll have about an hour for today's webinar. The presentation will last 45 to 50 minutes, and then we've allowed some time at the end for Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, you can submit them by typing into the, the chat area uh, on the control panel that you should see in your screen. We're also recording the, re uh, the webinar, and we'll be making it available on our website uh, in the very near future. Um, we'll be sending a link uh, to that recording and also a copy of the slides to anyone who registered for the webinar. So that'll help you determine if you want to uh, take copious notes or not. Our presenter this morning is David Gordon of Channel Marketing Group. Um, he's been in the industry for about 18 years. Uh, he's done a lot of work specifically with buying and marketing groups in the electrical distribution channel, but he also works with industrial and construction distributors. And uh, David is a frequent contributor to Industrial Supply Magazine as well. So thanks for, Daving us, uh, for joining us, David, and uh, let me hand over the presentation to you. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate it. Welcome, everyone. As you know, when uh, Rich promoted this, the areas we wanted to get into today is on the technology side. What are distributors investing in to help grow their business and more importantly, focus on the profitability side, either from a uh, profit improvement viewpoint or a productivity viewpoint. On the technology side, and some technology companies have been clients, we've noticed a change in who makes decisions. And this is across your organizational platform. We'll talk about that. Talk about how do we project and measure the ROI and what's happening to budgeting of technology expenditures and how it is escaping the traditional IT department. IT today, or technology today, and there's a distinction in the terminology, is much more pervasive within an organization. The days of the provence of it really being the IT department and the ERP center being the network, the nerve center, along with your quote unquote Microsoft servers and the Microsoft systems are gone. The business now is a lot of bits and bytes in lots of departments that need to integrate with the ERP systems and at times, Stand alone. So the business is becoming much more nuanced and to a degree some people say complicated because technology which is supposed to make everything easier creates more complications in the initial setup and the integration of these systems and then we now all have much more access to information to then act upon. So as many of you know, and hopefully a lot of you participated in, we conducted a short survey in mid-December to get a voice of distribution. And while the findings obviously are not definitive, there is some specific trending that we can look at that really is a microcosm of what's going on in the industry. And just like ROI, trending is more important sometimes than trying to hit the nail on the head. One of the questions that we asked got into how much a distributor is spending on technology. And as you can see on the chart, 42% of distributors are spending less than 1% of their sales in technology. Historically, from looking at various PAR reports in different industries, this is, has historically been the norm. But it's interesting when you start asking a question, because not everyone knows the numbers within their company, 22% of individual respondents said their company is not investing enough in technology. 
Uh, hopefully this is not just the IT people responding. But companies and individuals in different departments are seeing the opportunity to use technology in their own department to access and act upon information and better serve their customer, whether that customer is a internal customer or an external customer. So there is growth. And then you see that next level of companies that are spending between one and two and a half percent. We didn't quite frankly delve into the why or what they're investing in, but you've got companies that are investing into e-commerce and depending upon the system, that could be expensive. You've got companies investing in CRM and depending upon the pricing model and the technology, that can get expensive too. Whether those are 2017 expenditures or trending for those companies, obviously we don't know. But you can see that you know, about 22% are spending between a half and 1%, but that is basically equivalent to people saying not enough. We broke where they spend the money into two areas, business development and operations. And we're asking the trend here of where are you looking to invest? What types of things are trying to drive your business? On this chart, which is business development, we define as sales and marketing. Green is obviously what they already have. Blue is what they're considering. And we knew in some of the terminology, some respondents may not know, so that's why we have the yellow. So you focus on the blue of where they're putting the money. Number one is marketing automation. And we're seeing companies put more and more resources into marketing to help create demand, better attract, better penetrate existing accounts, utilize it for customer acquisition, and how to become more effective and efficient in this because they realize they need to communicate to more than their standard contacts about their points of differentiation. So put money into marketing automation. They're also putting money into price optimization. As margins have held steady or more likely eroded, more distributors are looking at software solutions to help optimize their pricing to the customer based upon individual product mix and things like that. Number three, and this was interesting, is that they're investing into social media integration and provisioning. Whether And this is, can be relatively low cost. Whether it's internal resources that are focusing on posting content on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, whether it's spending money to a degree on uh, SEO and AdWords and PPC. And then there are software tools like a Hootsuite that can handle some of this automatically once content is developed. Our, this gets then into the whole issue of ROI. And as much as we ideally would like to quantify the ROI aspect, and say, this is gonna generate 10% return. We're gonna get a 58% return, whatever the number specifically is. More and more companies are looking at it from a qualitative viewpoint. Issues such as what we have on the bottom in the legend, increasing accuracy, managing headcount, sales, reducing turnaround time, improving gross margin, increasing productivity, improving turns and better reporting. All of those directly relate to how you interact with the customer, how you generate more business, how you generate greater profitability from those customers. In each of the potential technology products on the left, we ask what are you, which criteria are you using? And you can see the range. Essentially, most of these categories are using multiple. They're looking at, can it increase sales? Can it improve margins? Does it increase productivity? So when you're looking at this in detail afterwards, you look at the color of the chart and how far along it is, but no decision is a standalone decision 
there are multiple criteria that depending upon who the decision makers are within your organizations, they're using those different criteria. And the challenge from an ROI perspective in all of these is what you may project in the beginning, trying to be specific of that number to prove that ROI at a point in time in the future is near impossible because it's not being handled in isolation. There are always dependent factors that drive into the process. But when you're presenting internal, when you're talking to prospective technology providers, these eight items on the bottom is really the areas that you focus on. The question is which areas are more important to you? We also asked who are the decision makers in acquiring these different types of software? And you can see on the right-hand side, the different departments, and uh, we're trying to get some relativity here. It's interesting that essentially in any of these, everyone wants to have some level of input. Maybe this is because of uh, smaller companies who may have responded to the survey, but what we have found, especially from our client perspective, is there's a lot of interdependencies within distributors, especially within independent distributors. People want to know what's going on. People want to know how this impacts my area of expertise, my department, and how can my department help. And then you've got the quote-unquote elephant in the room, Every one of these need to be integrated into the, either the ERP system, the overall network, or some other piece of technology. So there's those interdependencies. What this also means is when you're looking to develop uh, or sell, implement a piece of software, or you're evaluating, think about whom you need to influence internally to gain their support. On the operation side, same approach as what we did on business development, but here we looked at different pieces of software. We've got expense management. When I say Microsoft Office, that's going to whether it's uh, cloud-based at 365 or network-based cloud storage. You know, that's whether you're going to uh, Amazon Web Services or Microsoft's Azure or Google, some ERP systems are becoming cloud-oriented. Some companies are just looking to move information to the cloud as a storage facility. Sometimes it's to make it more uh, available to others. Standbys of EDI, VMI, whether that's at the customer level, which in some industries is prevalent, or types of customers is prevalent, or between distributors and manufacturers, and that's prevalent pricing, barcoding, and the others. Pricing on the operation side was the number one investment area. Part of that is because purchasing also gets tied into the operations and pricing side. Based upon the respondents, we had people with new ERP systems or upgrading their existing one. And people are interested in expense management software. And interestingly, this is also a category that had people asking, what is it? And there are different types of software here. You can use something like a Concor, which helps with uh, sales expenses, t and &E type of expenses, and then you, there are other more sophisticated systems. The ROI criteria in operations kind of works the same way. As you can see, we've got seven different criteria on the bottom. And here again, qualitative in nature, more goal-oriented, uh, but trying to achieve any of these from a specific quantitative viewpoint would mean you'd have to operate your business in a vacuum. But the green in every one of these, except for expense management, focus on productivity. It's not so much reducing expenses. It's not reducing headcount. It's how do we get more done with what we have 
so we can then eventually generate more throughput in a sense of sales through our existing organizational structure. Another thing to notice in a number of these is better reporting. That's an important criteria from ERP systems, and some of them have implemented analytics tools, or warehouse management, and the expense management to see if it's being appropriately, uh, you're getting an ROI on your expenses. Again, we looked at the decision makers. More so executive management involved. Less in sales, less in marketing. It's felt that the focus on the operation side is really an IT slash finance slash executive management decision. Much of this may also be because many of the respondents are independent distributors. So you've got executive management who gets involved in most aspects of the organization. Another question that we asked in the survey is, what are your biggest challenges and frustrations within the technology part? And then this was an open-ended question. And it was interesting when we went through each of the respondents, we then categorized them based upon the type of response of whether it's a tactical issue or a strategic issue. Because as you can see on the tactical, which really we labeled the frustrations, there are things that are, these issues a lot of times are moment in time. The speed cost slash cost is someone was pushing that speed to the interactivity to their uh, branches, i.e. Uh, their DSL cable, internet connectivity, the speed. Someone was talking about a conversion that they had, their ERP integration. Those are very tactical. Hopefully, you'll, you know, there is a window when you're going to get through that issue. But then you look at the strategic side. Number one was continued demand. There's always a request for more and more technology, more and more IT person time for integration, more and more can we edit our system to do X. So, therefore, it becomes a resource issue for the technology group. They don't have enough bodies and time. The continued investments is always the next greatest thing or the next tool that someone wants to integrate. E-commerce and digital marketing, very important. Some of the ERP systems are more inhibitors than inhibitors to growth than tools for success. Pricing, that's going to be a continual issue of how to continually optimize. Uh, the robustness and what to implement, and then trying to stay knowledgeable about all the different areas where technology is being integrated into the business and the training are strategic issues. This is especially true, David, when it comes to the smaller distributor. You know, it's, it, it's so hard to know where to focus your attention, where to focus your dollars. Uh, you know, it's a constant juggling act to, to stay abreast of uh, the latest technology and and uh, be able to continue to run your business without over investing in some areas, you know, and then the technology ends up not catching up, catching on and, you know, you ask yourself, did I need to do that? Well, you've got those challenges, Rick, with the smaller guys. You've also got with the smaller guys, a lot of them are either their own IT department, the people who or the person who is handling their technology really just learn the ERP system. Some of them don't even have IT people internal and outsource it. So it's a contracted role and a regular expense whose focus has been their servers and maybe their ERP, but not some of their functional aspects, some of these other department functional aspects. And then even for these departmental functional aspects, areas that they'd like to get into, aside from the cost that you reference, they don't have the internal body to execute. We've worked with some distributors who would like to get into e-commerce, companies less than $10, $15 million. They don't have a IT person. They don't have a marketing person. So they have desire, 
but ability to implement and then manage the system so that they could get an ROI is a challenge. And there are some models that need to be created. There are opportunities for some models uh, that will enable and essentially be coopetition to facilitate some of that, because otherwise these companies won't be able to have these resources. And it really gets into this broader issue of IT is no longer equal to ERP. It's looking at your business and all the different functional areas as an ecosystem, where all departments may have interactions with suppliers and with customers and need information, which is really the nerve center of the ERP system, to access that to then act upon to help drive the business. If you think of a traditional distributorship as these departments, and e-commerce, some companies put into marketing, some companies have it standalone. Customer logistics can also be a euphemism for the entire warehouse experience. So stocking, picking, delivery, I kind of just grouped into that area. This becomes your company. ERP is the IT department. So then we start thinking about what is the different software solutions that companies are currently looking at within each area. And I'm going to put up uh, some little boxes going to show you. We're not going to get into each of the uh, software pieces. If someone has some questions on it, please put it in through the chat box. And there are also more. As you'll see, we didn't put in everything. Sales, CRM. BA is business analytics and business intelligence. There are remote order entry systems. BIM is more at the contractor level. It's uh, building information modules, punch outs, the procurement, vending machines. Marketing has its list of, in this case, five different areas. E-commerce, sounds like it should be easy, but then here's a bunch of the other areas that you need to think about. And we're also doing some research right now at the end user level in the electrical industry of what they're looking for in e-commerce. And we're seeing adoption of defined as usage of systems, not necessarily online ordering, which back to our brief discussion on the small, con small distributor, he wants to play. The question becomes how to play is a number of tools on customer logistics. When you think delivery notifications, people like a Granger can send text messaging to customers that your order will be ready in 30 minutes. They can do it via email. They can automate it. How do you develop some of the same systems? So it just becomes another function. Within the ERP IT group, it's uh, five major areas that they're working on for themselves. And remember, all these other areas that we've touched on so far, their hands are going to be in that too. Your accounting finance department has its own sphere of influence on certain technology areas. Purchasing has its own. And you'll notice in some of these that there's duplication from some other areas. Doesn't mean you have to buy a, uh, different systems. People have to be taught what systems can do so it can be shared, which is also why the decision making has become more challenging for technology companies and also for you in trying to make the decision because there's multiple applications and different groups that can use it. HR, HR has its five areas at a minimum, and your training department may be looking at learning management systems, and that can split into four different areas, let alone trying to create videos, trying to create their own systems. And just like we're on today on a webinar, companies have varying skill sets in their comfort level of doing webinars within their own organization 
either for themselves or integrating with suppliers or using it as a customer service tool with specialists in pulling in suppliers at the same time, all of which can get done. And what we're trying to show you is that within your ecosystem, technology is much more pervasive. Your expenditure of the 41% may be, as the other 22% have said, we need more, may be much more. Because this expense, the technology expense, can be hidden in many other departments without a, without anyone consciously trying to do it. And then a com question that companies have is, is the software compatible with e each other system that's within your organization? What's the upgrade path within that company? What's that uh, supplier's product roadmap? So IT spending is growing within an organization as a percent of its overall company expenses if you reach beyond your IT department, which also makes overall budgeting more of a challenge, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, and it also, from an executive management viewpoint, makes you sit back and say, all right, what do we want our IT department to be? Where is its primary role? Where is its secondary role? And how does the IT mar department market itself internally within the company and treat the rest of the company as a customer to service and support some of these other areas. Because the key to enhancing the ecosystem, or another way to say it is, how do you use technology to profitably grow the business, is one, integration. How do you get the right integration happening within your organization relatively quickly because one of the worst things, most frustrating things for a lot of companies is acquiring software and then letting it sit until someone gets around to handling the integration. And then inevitably, once that's ready, there are other issues that delay further utilization beyond just training because the business has just continued to grow. When you're looking at technology, think about tomorrow. How is it scalable? What is expandable in the sense of other features into it? Because one of the things we've seen as a caution, the areas that we've cautioned clients on is, don't buy for maybe we'll use. If you haven't sold your organization on how we're gonna create some change based upon XYZ tools, it's gonna be challenging to get any ROI on your software. Buy in on the front end, is critical to achieving any level of qualitative uh, ROI. And beware of systems that you have acquired that are on subscriptions, especially monthly subscriptions that easily go on to a credit card and therefore are a operating expense and not a capital expense. Because at a point in time, you have to ask the question, are they being used? Because if they're not being used as intended, or not being used, period, now you've got a non-performing asset that's sitting on your budget that you may not even realize could be freed up to use something else. We talk about pervasive. We ask by department, do you have a budget for technology? Are you involved or an influencer in other departments' technology expenditures? So you can see the departments that have technology budgets or the ability to create a technology budget. You'd expect executive management, you'd expect IT. E-commerce today, kind of the epitome, the definition of technology. But marketing has a decent sized budget. And the warehouse, purchasing has some, sales has some. So there are various buckets within a company. But look at the influencers. They're influencing just about everything else within the organization. 
And looking at technology providers or priorities for the year, when you look at these seven, five of them are revenue generating, customer touching, business development oriented technologies in the sense of e-commerce, website, difference between the two is obviously the website itself in this case did not have uh, purchasing capabilities. Marketing, e-commerce adoption, it's great to spend the money on developing the system, and having the product, but if you can't get customers coming to the site, what's the value of that investment? So the respondents here, they've made the investment over the last year or two. They've now launched their site. They're trying to figure out how to get sales and mar sales to support it with the customers and marketing to be effective to drive demand. And then you've got people investing so, in the So when you look at this list of priorities, I'm in particular trying to differentiate between e-commerce and e-commerce adoption. The one, the top priority is people are saying we need an e-commerce solution, but then a lesser priority is those people who maybe already have an e-commerce solution, but they need to do a better job of utilizing it. Get That's it correct. It, 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 it's the evolution of where they are on the e-commerce journey. The first one is either we've made the investment and we're building it, or we need to make the investment. And number six is we have it, we've launched it, no one's coming to it. When you're looking at technology, think like your customers to a degree. Research that's been done in many of the industrial trades show that engineers, 75 to 85% of the time, depending upon whose survey you like, are already going out and doing product research and know what they're looking for. The number one tool, obviously, is Google. When you're considering software, Google should be your friend. You should go out and spend time and look at a number of the different companies that are in the various uh, technological areas. Be familiar with their features, what they claim is their benefits, some of the applications. Look at how they're funded. Are they uh, look how long they've been in business, how many customers, things like that. Understand what you're really trying to, what your challenge is, and what type of technology you're really looking for, and what features. It's easy to get upsold. Understand why you think you need whatever tool before you seek it. Do some of the ROI and consensus building ahead of time. What are you going to use this tool for? What's it important to you? Where qualitatively are you going to get a return? Or is it the shiny new tool, a new toy? Search to buy versus being sold. Because most of these companies have done a very good job training their business development people, which is what they call essentially their telemarketers who will tell you why their software is the greatest thing since sliced bread and the 12 different modules that they have. The question is on, on those 12 different modules, you may really focus on three. How strong are they in those three? Be ready also to implement before you buy. Now, granted, it'll take a little time to go through your own buying and evaluation process, but we've seen many companies who go and buy, but they can't implement for another six months. So you're buying software that's gonna sit there for six months, while that company will probably go through some upgrades. And, you're, and the clock is ticking on your expense. Evaluate it on the features you will use, not that you could use. Because the ones that, where you will use, or ones where you already know you can focus on improving your return, could be more touches to the customer, could be productivity, in the sense of like e-invoicing, 
you know you can cut postage costs, but you've also got X number of customers who want an invoice electronically, let alone they can take the information, build their customer sooner. How do you roll out the service quickly? Because ROI, as I've referred to or inferred, it's for the cost, but it's more the benefits. And the return really is what's the beneficial return, both from a financial, which can be a quite frankly a question mark because you might not be able to calculate it other than some projections, which uh, is another definition for projections can also be swag. I'm sure some understand the acronym for swag. But the return can be a return on investment, which is a financial. It's a return on time, on influence, on experience, whether that's the experience they've had in an industry. It's on happiness. I know it's a very uh, light term, but does it make your people internal happier that they have that tool, that they're able to do more with it? It's quality, it's ease of doing business for customers and to your suppliers, it's employee satisfaction, return on sales. These are just some of the areas that you may be redefining the term ROI and therefore justify why you're while you making a certain investment. Some thoughts, here's a couple of quotes I found out there. This was from the Huffington Post. Someone was asking about teacher evaluation numbers. And the person went in, talked to the teacher, wanted to know how the school was doing and how their student was doing on the standardized test. The teacher responded, how are you going to use the results? That tells you whether or not the test will work. How are you going to use it? What's it going to be good for? Knowing the how you're going to use the system to help you determine your ROI. And you've probably heard the phrase at times about uh, figures will not lie, or liars will use figures. And the quote came from a statistician from back in the late 1800s, it was also attributed to Mark Twain. But every one of the software companies that I've ever talked to will tell you that you can increase the business by X. How do they know? What control tests have been done? They're selling industry agnostic. You're in the industrial supply or the contractor supply industry. What expertise or focus have they had in that industry? How many customers have they had in that industry, let alone in a channel environment? And have they ever tracked anything? Ask these companies, what is their experience? Now, it's one thing if you want to look at software systems, let's say, that are more retail-oriented, consumer-oriented, but you know how you're going to adjust that. Many of these companies don't have experience. They have software that they want to sell across any platform. And once they do the initial integration and training, they're on to the next one. So what is their experience? Talk to people whom you know, find out what other systems are being used in your industry amongst people whom you know, so you can have your own network group. Because ROIs are built upon projections. Most of these companies, like I said, want to focus on a quantitative, but it's really a qualitative. And in talking to enough people who bought ERP systems, CRM systems, some marketing automation, some uh, uh, warehouse management tools, things like that. When they, when you get into talking to them and asking about the proposal and what was proposed versus what they bought in their experience, they say the numbers that were shared up front becomes meaningless. Uh, in the sense of they know it's coming from the software company. They basically mentally have to discount it because there's no basis for where the number is. Projections really mean if you do this 
or if your customers do this, if it's some tool that's going to target to your customer. The question there, you're therefore going to get XYZ number response, a 1% to 5% increase in sales, strictly from doing that tool. The question is, will you implement throughout your organization exactly the way and on a timely basis that their projections are based upon? And will your customers respond that way? It's like with email opens. It's nice to say it should be 15 to 20%. But that's based upon national projections, not what's going to be for you. It's nice to say surveys get a 2% response rate. Well, I've also had surveys get a 50% response rate. Comes down to what you do specific for you. SAP, very quality, very good company, quality company. But in talking to some of their salespeople, I've learned what some of their uh, ROI processes. And it really is a client-supported or prospect-supported sales trap. Part of their evaluative process is having a lot of questions that they go around within a distributorship or manufacturer and ask various people about not only the process, but where there are inefficiencies. They will sit with senior management and say, well, our, his, our experience is that when you implement our system, you can get a 1% to 7% increase in sales. And I'm just using the word sales for now because it could change by pro to be productivity, throughput, profitability, whatever. People will give them a response. A lot of times it's 3 to 5%. They'll then go and meet with other departments, and when it comes back to the final presentation, they'll say, well, we think we can increase for you by 3%. People in the meeting will then ask, how'd you get to 3%? Well, you told us that in the front end. Don't you think you can hit those numbers? So that's why we call it a self-supported sales trap. It becomes circular uh, information. Ask for their questions and develop your own estimates. And then you can measure your people against that. Because you know your company, you know your customers if it's a tool that's going to impact them, and you know what areas are important to you. The key with ROI is measuring what matters for you, to you. It could be in the area of cost savings. But that becomes a one-time credit, and sometimes it's not realized. We had a client who, this goes back a couple of years ago, implemented e-invoicing. They did the ROI based upon postage and paper savings. Showed could get a payback inside of six months, maybe even quite frankly a little bit sooner. They decided to implement it. They got, uh, inside of that six months, about a 60% adoption rate. One of the elements on the payback analysis was, if we do this and we get to a certain percent, we have, I can't remember quite frankly whether it was two or three people devoted to getting the invoices out, we can reduce one of those people. And then when we get to another percent, we can reduce another one of those people. The decision was made, they implemented. The IT person who had put together the ROI analysis said, all right, we can get rid of one of these people at this time. Senior management said they chose not to release any of those people because of loyalty. Now, the IT person kept being frustrated of, you know, we're doing this to reduce costs, but they won't let go of so let's just say Julie. Common that uh, I shared back with him, it's an independent distributor. The owners can choose whom they want to release and not. And it means it's money out of their pocket. 
not out of yours. You've done the right thing in showing them the payback analysis. They're looking at ROI as a service to the customer, not necessarily a cost savings. So that's why I say sometimes it's realized, sometimes it's not. Sometimes the definition is based upon customer touches. You're looking for an alternative sales organization, so marketing automation tools get used to get more visibility. Sometimes it can be sales increases, cost of goods, margin improvement, or try to get more throughput. Just to give you a little uh, insight into how, like on a CRM marketing automation company does, one company I've talked to recently, here's 11 key questions that they ask. And I won't go through them all, but this is their sales approach. This is how they say you should evaluate the company. Now, go back a few years ago, there were companies that focused strictly on CRM, Customer Relationship Management, which many companies use for their sales force. Some companies use as a holistic contact management system, customer service system. And there were tools that were strictly marketing automation. Now you're seeing more and more of these two services being merged into one offering. However, not every company is equal, equally qualified or has an equal system on both sides. So this came from one company. Here's from another company. The two are direct competitors, and when you ask them for whom they compete with, both of their names are on it. The second one, they ask, some key questions about users and sales. How many contacts are you going to have? That's going to spit out a price. But you see on the bottom, they've got nine different modules. They're assuming you ascribe the same level of need and value to each one of these functions. Question is, do you? Now, the area where you start looking at is you look at that fifth bullet, integration with third-party CRMs. You can't take it just uh, on fact. The question is you got to ask, what are the other tools? Because there may be tools that are industry-specific for you that they don't. And therefore, because it becomes an add-on, term add-on means additional cost to you. Talk about a competitive market. One of the online services that rates software CRM systems are all the graphics up on the top. But then the bullet in between, where it says with Microsoft Dynamics, is a whole bunch of other companies that don't that play in that market or say that they play in that market but aren't listed. So this is why you have to do your own research to identify what you're looking for. Definition of value for a marketing automation viewpoint. What's the value of these 10 different bullet points? It changes by company. So this marketing automation CRM is just a microcosm of what you can do for each of the different software solutions or areas to improve your business on both the revenue and a profitability side. I just kind of, quite frankly, picked CRM and marketing automation because uh, revenue development tools, business development is an area that we focus more on than the operations side. Two different philosophies. First in the upper left-hand column, from Steve Jobs. And I'll let you read the whole thing, but the areas in yellow become the important part. He's always been attracted to the revolutionary change but it's harder. And not only is it harder on developing the solution, it becomes harder on training and it becomes harder within your business to gain consensus. But it could have a much larger return. And then you've got the quote on the bottom right, the philosophy of continuous improvement. Get a little bit better every single day. Buy what you need and when you need more, upgrade or add on modules. The Each company, each person, each department has their own style. Determining what's right for you is critical in your initial internal sales process. 
but don't get paralyzed through over-analysis. It's more important to do something to prove, do something to improve success and achieve success and achieve the benefit. Because once you have that, then you can have the continuous process improvement approach and upgrade to the next scenario. We mentioned earlier about budgeting. Just a, simple, a quick word. What we have found works. First look at the prior year. What's essential and needed? Identify what's not used. Decide if we really need it, should get rid of it. Or it may be used for quote unquote one customer, but happens to be a very large customer. It just go through that questioning process. Budget based upon priorities solicited from the departments, and then look at what's department specific. Cost justify, quantitative versus qualitative. And sometimes if you have to re-engineer your business, you might be able to identify it very quantitatively. But you know, there's not a uh, unlimited dollar amount that has to be spent, or that can be spent, excuse me. So from a technology side, knowing there's always going to be the next greatest thing that someone's going to want to invest in, you need to prioritize what you have to free up the funds. So we tried giving you a little bit different approach where it's not strictly numeric, it's more thought process uh, to guide because what we're seeing amongst many companies is they intuitively want to get into certain areas, offer certain functions, know what they need. It's how to differentiate amongst systems and really much more of a complex selling approach to pull in the input from multiples and say, how is this going to improve our business? Because yeah, most people... I, I'd like to get into... We have a question, and, and that can maybe explore that a little bit further. It's You're suggesting a less numbers-driven approach. You know, Could you talk about why that is? <coughs> what we have found is with the less... You can look at, at numbers as a starting point. We have not found really, quite frankly, anyone who follows their numbers to see if they actually achieve their goal as number one. So therefore, you know, whether we have 362,000 invoices coming through our system and we want to try reducing it 10%, you're still going to have a lot coming through the system. So qualitatively, what are we looking for? Do we want the same? Is it okay if the same came through, but it was operated much more efficiently? Or if we, let's go back to the marketing automation, a lot of distributors have 2,000 customers. What's the value of starting to communicate to them? It's A, communicate to all 2,000 customers versus your salespeople focusing on the top 100. Do we say, all right, we're going to take get a 10% growth? Tough to challenge to figure out what that is and why that growth came about. That's why we say, let's figure out what the goal really is first and work towards that goal. Several of your slides talked about all the different uh, departments within a company that are involved in many of these technology decisions. Um, what do you think is a good way to gain consensus within a company when you're talking about maybe what kind of uh, technology to acquire or to implement? Well, a lot of that comes from, first of all, doing a little bit of high-level business analysis. And it really comes down to, uh, well, I'll use the example of what I just did with a client uh, earlier today. Margins are starting to decline. So it's a case of looking at the product mix analysis. It's a case of looking at price optimization. It's a case of looking at, in this case, of marketing automation to reach out to more customers. But in this meeting, we have sales, operations, and executive management. It's pulling everyone together for them to understand the higher level organizational issues. Now, if the issue is price optimization, that's typically going to be a sales, a 
depending upon the organization, purchasing slash pricing department. You'll have IT involved. You'll have CFO, COO, CEO. Let's just call them executive management because every company is structured a little bit different there. It's addressing what, figuring out what the business issue is first and pulling in the applicable personnel who are affected by that business issue. Because none of these decisions should be made strictly based upon technology. It's what is the business issue that it's going to solve. And technology just enables doing things we did years ago differently, more effectively, maybe at a lower cost. Because it enables us to reach more. We have a question from a, a distributor who's wanting to know, are distributors considering investing in technology to assist in vendor-managed inventory projects? Yeah, they are, and it's very much distributor-specific because it ties to specific customers slash customer segments. VMI in some industries is between the distributor and the manufacturer. But VMI and others is between the manufacturer, between the distributor and their customer. Typically, it's going to be a larger customer. Usually, it's MRO. But VMI is a tool to really store room solutions. And there are companies that can provide it. You really need to be asking your customer, what is he trying to achieve? Is VMI the right solution? Is uh, vending machines the right solution? Is it a case of putting barcodes on and a wireless application, which some of the ERP companies already have integrated into their system? Uh, there are also some technologies that tie to smartphones and letting your salesperson scan if he's going into that storeroom. So there's a number of different solutions to achieve it. It is a narrow segment of the customer base because the customer needs to be doing enough volume to justify really having a storeroom solution. Our, another uh, question from a distributor is, are you seeing any areas of technology that you kind of view as up and coming to manage inventory, uh, both at the distributor's location and at a customer's location? Well, we just talked about the storeroom solutions, which really gets into the customer issues. We have seen, seen some things there. Within a warehouse, I mean, obviously people have gone to wireless, they've gone to the handheld scanners. Uh, I'm hearing from some people who focus on, who are consultants who focus on to the operation side about starting to look at uh, robotics. And there are different robotic systems for warehouse solutions, whether it's getting into picking, it's uh, laying out the warehouse so that your quote unquote top 300 items are right next to the conveyor and are auto picked. So there are some things that are happening there. A lot of it, quite frankly, comes down to the size of the distributorship and the ability to invest. The bigger companies are, the more of these types of tools that are out there because they'll make those investments and have the uh, have the uh, turns that are applicable or necessary to drive the returns there. Well, there it is, it is possible to get to get to be like an Amazon. The question is, can you afford to get to an Amazon? Right. Uh, we promised the participants that we would keep the webinar to an hour, and we're right about at an hour right now, so we'll have to draw things to a close. Uh, again, I want to thank our presenter, David Gordon of Channel Marketing Group. Uh, very quickly, David, what's your email in case anybody wants to reach out to you? It's D Gordon, G O R D O N, at channelmkt.com. All right, and again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Epicor, for their support of this webinar. 
Uh, you can learn more about them at epicor.com. Thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your day.